Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Khalil Jahshan. I'm executive director of Arab Center Washington, DC. And I would like to welcome you to this uh, conference uh, that will take place all day today, entitled Democracy in Crisis, Geopolitical Shifts, and U.S. Challenges in MENA. The 2022 Arab Opinion Index, some of you have participated in and helped us uh, disseminate the results uh, at the time. Uh, index, that index was conducted through face-to-face -face interviews uh, back in June and uh, the last one, June to December of 2022. Uh, we did uh, involve 33,300 individual respondents in 14 Arab countries, actually, including Algeria, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Mauritania, Morocco, Palestine, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, and, and Tunisia. Uh, as you could tell, it's one of the largest public opinion surveys uh, conducted. Uh, there are a few others, of course, uh, in the Arab world. But in that public opinion survey, uh, essentially uh, a majority of Arabs uh, surveyed, as a matter of fact, a full 72%, uh, to be exact, supported a democratic system in their countries, compared to only 19% who expressed opposition uh, to the idea as a system of governance. And despite similarly high rates of support for democracies throughout the Arab region, support was highest, which was interesting, both in the Mashriq and in the Maghrib. Uh, countries uh, involved and in the list that I just read. The events of Arab Spring, of course, as all of you know, more than a decade ago, emphasized these popular and widespread aspirations for democratic governance across the Middle East and North Africa. However, the processes of democratic transformation that followed were met with greater repression, military coups, civil wars, and the entrenchment of authoritarianism. In recent years, shift in the regional, shifts in the regional geopolitical order and emerging alliances have created a new axis of authoritarian powers and repressive partnerships that have become not only accepted, but enabled by Western democracies pursuing their diverse and often competing uh, interests in the region. Developments such as the rehabilitation of the Assad regime, the recent Saudi-Iran rapprochement, the Abraham Accords and their subsequent incarnations, Turkey's re-entry into the regional order, and the United States policy of realignments that continues to unfold on a daily basis, including the recent India-Middle East-Europe economic corridor known as IMEC, the U.S. great power competition uh, with Russia and China may further contribute to the erosion of democratic principles and of prospects for political, genuine political reforms across the region. Therefore, Arab Center Washington, D.C. is dedicating its eighth annual conference to exploring the current crisis facing democratization and the implementation of reforms across the Middle East and North Africa. Today's conference explores the current state of democracy and democratic regression in the MENA region and focuses on its significance for US policy toward the region and the status of human rights throughout. Experts throughout the day, more than a dozen of experts throughout the day, will analyze the implications of both recent geopolitical shifts and the emerging authoritarian order, the trend of rehabilitating autocratic and oppressive regimes, the impact of current economic crises, growing human insecurity, the need for reforming Middle East politics and governance, and democracy promotion in the region. I hope you will remain with us all day for all these uh, different panels uh, to basically uh, listen to the discussions. I hope that discussions will prove to be stimulating with regards to all these issues uh, that I have raised. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, I'm very honored and delighted to introduce our opening keynote speaker uh, for the conference, His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Munsef Marzouki. Dr. Marzouki is a former president of the Republic of Tunisia and was the country's first democratically elected president after the January uh, 14th uh, revolution in 2011. He is a doctor of medicine, a human rights activist, and the author of numerous works on political philosophy in the Arab world. More recently, during the fall semester of 2022, he was a senior uh, fellow with the Democracy in Hard Places Initiative at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School. During his presidency, Dr. Marzuki was a voice for social and revolutionary activism, uh, not just in Tunisia, but he focused and called for civilian, uh, civil, uh, civilian rights or civil rights, curtailment of the security apparatus, economic sovereignty in the country, and transforming the presidency into a position of service to the Tunisian public. He was also the founder of the Center Left Congress Party for the Republic, CPR, one of the parties that formed the governing coalition from November 2011 uh, to February 2014. On December 23rd, 2014, Dr. Marzouki founded the Movement uh, for Popular Citizenship, Hirak Shab al muwatanin a civil movement uh, seeking to encourage active citizen participation among all uh, Tunisians, particularly those who were marginalized under previous regimes. Dr. Marzouki earned his medical degree at the University of Strasbourg in 1973 with specialties in neurology, internal medicine, and public health. His remarks will focus on democratic transition in the Arab world, challenges, and prospects. Dr. Marzouki, welcome, please. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Jashant for this introduction, and uh, I'm very proud to be here with you, and I uh, thank you all for your presence. Of course, I would have liked to come here and to talk about success story and how Tunisia is now is progressing on the path of uh, building up a new democratic Arab state, and I would have liked to talk about our success, but unfortunately, Unfortunately, this is not the case. Once again, I am uh, in France as a political exile. Once again, I was sentenced last year at four, uh, four years in jail for treasons. Once again, we have about 50, yes, 50 uh, top leaders of the opposition currently in jail. Once again, Tunisia is under dictatorship. I wouldn't say hard dictatorship. I think it's really poor miserable dictatorship, populist dictatorship, the worst of this kind of political regime. The fact that we have lost our challenge to be the first Arab country having a real uh, democratic states and real people of what I call the people of citizens. Well, uh, as I'm here in the United States, I was asked by uh, the organizer to talk about the, the relationship to the the American government with what's, what's happening in, in Tunisia and the Arab world related with whether the US government is promoting really a democracy in our region or not. Well, it's uh, of course a very difficult question to answer, but I would like here to, to quote some of uh, uh, the last uh, statement by uh, American officials. Here I have the State Department spokesman Net price. This is what he said about the parliamentary election last year. The parliamentary elections that took place in Tunisia represent an essential initial step toward restoring the country democratic trajectory. I was extremely surprised to see because it's, uh, in fact, this so called uh, parliamentary leading to restoring the country democratic trajectory were fake. fake totally fake and totally successful. Only 10% of the population participated in this election. Uh, 
what other kind of uh, statement I have here, the spokesman, this is a little bit better. We are deeply concerned by the reported arrests of multiple political figures, business leaders, and journalists in Tunisia in recent day. We respect the aspiration of the Tunisian people for an independent and transparent judiciary that is able to protect from the matter of freedom of right. That's all. Uh, what else? I have uh, also a statement here by, uh, by uh, Mr. Blinken himself. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, statement. We share the concern expressed by many Tunisians that the process of drafting the new constitution limited the scope of genuine debate and also that the new constitution could weaken Tunisia's democracy, could weaken. No, it, would, it has uh, literally destroyed uh, the constitution of the revolution and now we have a, a constitution of a dictators, dictatorship. So as you see, uh, I would say that uh, it's too late, too little. But of course, I'm not uh, asking the, uh, the American government to send the army you know, to restore democracy in Tunisia. This is not the case at all. Uh, we have seen what's this kind of politics what, uh, in Iraq and the, the outcome of this kind of... No, of course, I'm not asking for this. But I would have liked that uh, the coup in Tunisia, because it was a constitutional coup, was labeled as a coup. This never happened. But I must, uh, even if I, I may say a little bit skeptical or even cynical, I would say that I was not surprised. I was not surprised by this attitude because uh, when I was in charge in Tunisia, uh, it was my own, my, my uh, astonishment, my main problem, how come that we are not helped by Western democracy? This is a democracy. This is, we are fighting for democracy. We are trying to set up democratic regime uh, uh, we are very close to the Western values, etc. How come that uh, we are not we are not helping? Here, I would like to uh, talk about one experience. It's uh, painful, but I have. Uh, but this painful experience uh, helped me to have to uh, acquire my first. Uh, I would say my first belief or my first uh, conviction about democracy and the relationship with West, the West. Uh, in 2013, uh, it happened that Francois Hollande at the time, the French president, came to visit, official visit to Tunisia, just three days after the coup in Egypt. I know Francois Hollande very well because uh, I, would, I would say he's a friend of mine, but I know him very well. So I said, Francois, what's your position, the position of France about the, the coup? Uh, he said, oh, yes, I know. It's, uh, what, what do you know? This is a coup, and this is a military coup, and this is the first, for the first time, the, the first president uh, uh, democratically elected in Egypt is removed from office. What's your position? Oh, yes, you know, it's a very difficult question we have to think about, etc. And during the press conference, I was very clear to say, this is a coup, uh, President Morsi must be released, etc. We cannot accept it. And... Francois Hollande just repeated the same saying, we would like Egypt, you know, to move forward to peaceful solutions, et cetera. But he didn't condemn the coup at all. And there I have, uh, at the time I have acquired my first conviction about the fact that we Arabs, we have to rely on ourselves to promote democracy in our region and that we have to forget about any kind of Western help. And th this was very, I wouldn't say very surprising, but I saw that, uh, in fact, the Western countries were not very excited by our democratic revolution, not only because uh, there are Islamists could be uh, coming power, et cetera, but for different, many different reasons. The first of this reason is the fact that uh, the Western government was very happy with the, our dictatorship. It was good business, it was good relationship, it was good security uh, issues, et cetera. They were very, very happy about this. And they weren't so happy, you know, to see democratic states in our region because first, some Islamist party could come to power and second, because uh, it was not sure that uh, those democratic regime, because they have the public opinion, would accept normalization with Israel, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> my first conviction was that if we want to promote democracy in our country, we have to rely on ourselves. It doesn't mean that we are going to um, 
to have this democracy against the West, but surely not with the help of the West. This was my first conviction. My second conviction was also about the, the shift of power in the region. For decades, we, we thought that uh, the US government and the Western government are the main power deciding of our fate, <clears throat> that if they want democracy to succeed, they would just push the button and say, hey, we want democracy everywhere, and then everybody would obey, abide. And then <clears throat> during my three years I was in office, I saw very clearly that in fact, it was not the, the reality. The, the, there is a shift in the power of the, this region, which means that <clears throat> in fact, the regional power are the power who decided the fate of the region. The Irani, Iranian regime, Saudi regime, Emirati regime, the Israeli regime, those are the powers that this have decided that to block and uh, the, to say that we have to stop this wave of democratization because it could be dangerous. And uh, I can assure you that without the decision of the Emirati and the Saudi and the Israelis and the Iranian, maybe our revolution would have succeeded. We can say that really we, we, we have uh, we have committed a lot of errors in Tunisia about you know, the way of uh, dealing with a lot of issues, economic issues, et cetera. But I'm quite sure that even if we have succeeded in dealing with this economic issue, the result would have been the same. There was a veto, regional veto, Algerian veto, Emirati veto, Egyptian veto, Iranian veto, et cetera. All those countries have decided that this wave of democratization should stop and must stop because it is very dangerous for them for their own political regime. And then the American, the Western country, they didn't have any, any things to say. I remember that uh, in 2013, I wrote a letter to President, President Obama saying, look, uh, we are in a mess in Tunisia because we are facing a harsh counter-revolution led mainly by the Emirati. The Emirati did put, you know, put a lot of money in, in Tunisia. The Emirati, the Algerian used to send us terrorist group, but the Emirati used to send us a lot of money, you know, to uh, to control the media and to control political party, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I wrote to President Obama. I met him was here in Washington twice. Said, "Look, Mr. President, really, if you want to help us promote democracy, install democracy in Tunisia, you please tell your friends the Emirati to stop intervening in our." Uh, and then I, of course, I never received any uh, response. And I saw that, uh, I don't know if, uh, I guess that even if you have said something to the Emiratis, now the shift of power in the region means that the regional power are the power who decide what's going to happen in our region and no longer the American or the Western and the, the European. And this was my first, my second conviction. It means that we have to deal with uh, mainly with the opposition of those regional power. And uh, I can understand why the, uh, the US government or the, the French government has so little impact on promoting our democracy. And here I come to the third, my third conviction. My third conviction, maybe it would come for you as a surprise. My third conviction is that probably, probably the Arab Spring come too late, two, two decades too late. Why? Because we, uh, you, you remember, some of you, I don't know, if some of you do, you, probably you remember that during the 80s and the 90s, the wave of democratization seemed at the time unstoppable. And, you know, at, at that time, everybody was quite sure, like Fukuyama, that now, okay, that's uh, it's the time of the the success and the triumph of democracy all over the world. We're going to get rid of the dictatorship, not only in Eastern Europe, not only in South America, but even in the Middle East. It didn't happen. Uh, uh, I think it did have the, the triumph against dictatorship in the Middle East. Uh, and the, the revolution, our revolution came at, at, the, at the time where this wave, this extraordinary wave of the 80s, of the 90s, you know, was probably coming to the end. And then, unfortunately for us, we arrived at the time where this 
wave yes was completely uh, yeah, fading uh, running out of energy uh, why do i say this because the problem of the democratization in tunisia cannot separate it the fact of the democratization of the whole region i am deeply convinced that we cannot we could not you know build up a democracy uh, like an island uh, within this ocean of dictatorship but the se my second conviction also is that even if uh, the the crisis the deep crisis of or, or the the failure of the democratization in the middle east and north africa is also part of the failure of democracy itself in the world of the receding of democracy itself in the world uh, i have just uh, here, some the, the conclusion about the fate uh, about the situation of democracy in the world by the by the last report of a very interesting uh, uh, report. This report uh, it's uh, published by the, the Swedish NGO. Maybe you know it, Idea. I think uh, said about the, the situation of the, de the democracy in the world <clears throat> since 2015. And here you, I have the, the, the main conclusion. And the main conclusion are terrific, are, are extremely uh, uh, disappointing. First, more countries moved toward authoritarianism in 2020 than toward democracy. Second, troubling decline in democracy are seen in some of the world's largest countries, Brazil, India, as well as in the United States and certain European Union members. Third, so democratically elected government, including established democracy, are increasingly adopting authoritarian tactics, often with significant popular support. Popular support. Uh, fourth, authoritarianism is deepening in non-democratic regime, hybrid and authoritarian regime. Five, electoral integrity is increasingly questioning, even in established democracies, without often without evidence. Six, many democracies worldwide proved resilient during the pandemic, introducing democratic innovation, fortunately. Seven countries worldwide held election in challenging conditions. This is also good news. But in fact, the bad news are much more uh, numerous than the, the good news. We are facing a deep crisis of democracy all over the world. And our failure in Tunisia and the Arab world is just part of this crisis. So it's not only our fault. I'm not here to confess that, hey, we are, we cannot, et cetera. No. We did our best. We have fought for many decades for democracy, but for a lot of reason, it, it, it happened that uh, maybe our uh, uh, our revolution came too late. We didn't uh, enjoy profit of the you know this uh, the wave of the 80s of the 90s, uh, and now we are facing the, the problem that our failure is part of the deep problem of democracy itself all over the world. That means that if we want to succeed in Tunisia, we have to have a new birth of democratic revolution in the whole region. And if we want this whole region, you know, to be, to achieve democratic revolution, we have to have better world where democracy is once again in a new wave of success and not receding like we're seeing this. Here I must, uh, I have forget to, to tell you about my astonishment about uh, when I see the, the American government uh, supporting the regime like the, uh, the Saudi regime or the Emirati regime or even the Egyptian regime, say, hey, those regimes, the Egyptian, the Emirati and the Saudi, what, are, what kind of regime they are promoting? They are promoting what I call the Chinese model. The Chinese model is that we are going to solve the whole problem by what? By economic development uh, without no freedom. This is, the, this is the Chinese model. So I can understand, and you know that the United States now is in conflict with the, this Chinese model. The United States, the West are trying to sell their own model that we can have economic development with freedom. The Chinese model is we are going to solve the problem, your problem in the third world by the fact that we encourage economic development, but forget about freedoms. 
So when I see the support that the United States are giving to regimes like the Saudi, the Emirates, et cetera, I see that they are, in fact, they are encouraging the Chinese model and not the American model, not the Western model. Somebody can explain me to how, 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 how this could be uh, explained as, a, uh, personally, I don't understand. Now, what kind of conclusion? I, uh, uh, here I, I turn to you, I know that uh, you know Emil Habibi, you know Emil Habibi, you know right. Palestine, uh, right? I learned from him this word of opti-pessimistic. It means that there is no reason in this world to be optimistic because of all the horror that we are facing. He used the term pessim pessimist. Yeah. And uh, we, are, we are no reason also to, to despair because there are a lot of reason to hope. So he has invented this word of pessimistic. I, this is my attitude. I am a pessimist, optimistic person. I know that this would be uh, pessimistic because really we are in a mess in Tunisia and the whole region, democracy is in mess all over the world. But I'm also optimistic, why? Because it's true that democracy is in a mess, but dictatorship also is in a mess. I can assure you that now in Tunisia, in Egypt, you know, uh, the country revolution is in charge, but the country revolution is extremely in very, very difficult situation. Tunisia is a failed state. Uh, Egypt also is a failed state. Uh, and, and I expect, I expect a new wave of revolution very soon. What's happening in Syria now in, uh, you know, this is for me something very, uh, meaningful because what's happening in Syria, you know that the Syrian people is probably the, the Arab people who have paid the, the highest price for uh, for uh, his liberation. And you know, millions of people have been displayed, hundreds of people killed, et cetera, et cetera. And even with this, this kind of situation in, in uh, uh, what's the name of the city in uh, the Druze? Swaida. Sweden, in Sweden, yes, in Sweden, people are taken to the street with the same, exactly the same slogan that we have had in Tunisia 11 years before, it means the people want the fall of the regime. Uh, this is why I'm uh, uh, optimistic. And also because the same, you know, I never liked the, the word of uh, Arab Spring because it's, uh, 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 it was not spring. It was not. Uh, I will. I prefer the word of Arab volcanoes because it was really birth of volcano with the ashes, with you know the fumes, with the chaos, etc. This is the reality. But you know that volcanoes are also uh, okay. Why people stick living uh, around the volcanoes because volcanoes are are the, the main reason of uh, you know good soils etc cetera, etc cetera. so what's happening now in, in the arab world is you have you have had the the first explosion in 2011 then some of the explosion came later and i expect i really expect that in the years to come there would be a new wave of revolution a new wave of explosion for, for the main reason you know corruption uh, poverty uh, repression etc cetera, etc cetera. and the, the fact that the, the dictatorship, whether they are populist or they are, you know, military, also, they don't have any, uh, they cannot solve any problem because they are the problem. They are the first, the most important problem are this kind of regime. This is why I expect that we are going to have new waves of, uh, of and this is why I think that democracy still has, uh, has a future because look what's happening. Even in China, you know, China was given as a model for uh, dealing with the COVID epidemic, et cetera. And we saw that it was not the case. So it's true that democracy is in a mess, but uh, also dictatorship is in a mess. And we have to also uh, do ex all what we have to do you know, to promote our own vision of the world, because I do believe that it's the best, because not, o not only because it could help fight against corruption, et cetera, but the most important is that it could uh, promote dignity. The more dignity is extremely important. Dignity of the person, dignity of the people, and this is, for me, the most important thing. I hope I haven't been too long. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Marzuki, for your uh, honest, brutally honest assessment of the situation.
uh, with regards to uh, democracy and authoritarianism uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, and I appreciate your challenge uh, for all of us to be pessimists in, in looking at uh, these uh, uh, issues, acknowledging reality as it is and focusing on, let's say, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, although sometimes it looks like there isn't even a tunnel at the end of the light. But uh, we have to uh, continue uh, our work. Uh, and for you, as, as a uh, prominent Democrat uh, working for democracy uh, in the Arab world, we appreciate your efforts. And uh, we look forward to seeing more uh, work and, and wish you uh, better luck in, in, uh, in, in the future. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the program uh, will continue. Unfortunately, Dr. Marzuki has uh, a meeting, very important meeting. He's here, he just arrived in town and has some very important meeting uh, schedule, including in about 15 minutes is the first meeting. It's a 10 minute walk from here. So he's gonna rush uh, there. So we will not be able to have a Q&A here, but there will be Q&As throughout the day uh, in all the panels. So your input as an audience is more than welcome. That's why you have these uh, cards in, in front of you. And we would be we'd appreciate your questions uh, as we proceed. We're ready to go to panel one, and I would like to invite at this time uh, the panelists and uh, Dr. Daniel Bromberg, who will uh, moderate this panel, uh, to come up here and uh, begin uh, the panel. Thank you for your presence. Please stay where you are. If you want to grab a cup of coffee real quickly, please do so at this time. Thank you. Thank you. How are you? Thank you. I appreciate you helping us with that. Yeah, over here. Um, okay. Okay, great. Uh, ten, to, ten to four minutes per person. Can you hear me? Good morning, Spachir. My name is Dan Brumberg, and I've been told that we need to move quickly into the panel uh, because uh, time is of the essence and we may have lost a few minutes. So uh, I had all kinds of profound things to say to frame our discussion, but I'm gonna just put them all aside and uh, maybe they'll just uh, pop up later, but I'm delighted to be here. My name is Dan Brumberg. I am a, uh, a professor of comparative government at Georgetown uh, University, uh, where I directed the democracy and governance program for 14 years, uh, along with various other colleagues. Uh, and I am a senior non-resident fellow at the Arab Center as well for, gosh, how many years has it been? It's been a while already. Uh, so I'm delighted uh, to be here. I just, I wanna say that one thing that only it's, uh, we're talking about democracy assistance versus democracy promotion. Uh, Ken Wallach once said to me, the former director of NDI, we don't promote democracy, we assist it. So the assistance part really depends on the actions and perspectives of actors on the ground. Um, and so we can get into that as we go ahead. So uh, with that semi-profound remark, uh, I would like to introduce our panel in the order that they will speak. Each of you will have roughly 10 to 12 minutes to speak. Uh, and uh, then we'll go to question 
and answer or Q&A as they say here in DC. Uh, our first panelist is Natasha, Natasha Hall, who's a senior fellow at the Middle East Program at the Center for Strategic International Studies, where I have a bunch of colleagues. Uh, delighted to have you here. Uh, Nader Hashemi. Nader is a colleague of mine for a number of years, and he always used to have me back at his former abode uh, in Denver. And uh, we're meeting here for the first time, but he's now joined the faculty at Georgetown University, where he directs the Center for Christian Muslim Understanding. So it's a special delight to say hello, Nader, and to, to welcome you to this panel. Amy Hawthorne, a long-term friend, how many years? It's been a while, who, of course, directed the research for POMED and is an expert on issues of political and social change, not only uh, in the Arab world, but of course, uh, in, well beyond the Arab world, including Turkey and other countries. So great to see Amy here. And finally, Dana El Kurd, who is assistant professor of political science at the University of Richmond and non-senior, uh, non-resident senior fellow like I am at the Arab Center uh, here in DC. So without further ado, we're gonna start with Natasha. Each of you, as I to reiterate, has roughly 10, to 12 minutes, and I, did, I didn't say seconds before, by the way, did I? I hope not. 10 to 12 minutes, and uh, we'll go through the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan, and, and thanks to the Arab Center for inviting me. Um, this is an incredibly impor important series of events uh, today and topics. So uh, the question that I was prompted with with this invitation was, uh, what does Assad's rehabilitation mean for democratic transition in Syria? To be honest, that question kind of took my breath away. Um, the Assads have controlled Syria for over half a century, and Bashar al-Assad is walking red carpets, most recently in Beijing, uh, after committing the most egregious war crimes of a generation for the past 13 years. Uh, let me briefly recap the ferocity of those war crimes, uh, attacking over 600 hospitals, uh, imprisoning and torturing half a million people, of which 130,000 there, thereabouts remain in unspeakable confinement or in mass graves, killed half a million people, displaced half the country, and used chemical weapons on his own people at least 350 times. So when I was asked that question, what does the rehabilitation of Assad mean for, for democracy, uh, not just in Syria, frankly, but worldwide, uh, it's a death knell. And it's also a death knell to international norms that we hold dear. With that said, I'm going to be a pess optimist. Was that what, was that what it's called? Um, <laughs> because today we just see breathtaking displays of bravery all throughout the country still. Uh, protests against the regime, protests against local authorities. And so I think it's safe to say that democratic movements are not dead in Syria or elsewhere in the region. All of that said, uh, I'm quite pessimistic in the short term. Um, and I think it's probably for the reason we're all probably a little bit pessimistic today. And that's simply because the, the allies of authoritarianism in the region are more committed and stronger than the allies of democracy. The, uh, you know, Newton's third law doesn't exist in Syria for every action, whether it's chemical weapons usage or steps towards normalization, there is no equal and opposite reaction from the international community. Uh, quite the opposite. We've seen a complete disappearance of stabilization funding. You were talking about democratic assistance. Uh, even cuts to humanitarian funding. Uh, there's no Syria envoy in the United States. Um, the UN process has been impotent for years. Uh, and yet you still hear resolution 2254, which calls for a political transition repeated like this mantra without any kind of theory of change. And in that, it kind of reminds me of resolution 242 for the Palestinians, and that makes me very, very concerned. On the other side of that equation, you have regimes, uh, regional powers, sort of forcing this counter movement of authoritarian diffusion and collaboration. For them, the threat of revolution and the promise of non-alignment is simply stronger than the threat of Assad and the promise of a bilateral relationship solely with the United States. Uh, for the United States, 
uh, the threat of China is stronger than pretty much everything else, uh, including asset normalization. Um, and so as a result, when the United States speaks to regimes like the United Arab Emirates, uh, it's likely that a suspected Chinese military base is probably going to supersede anything about Assad normalization and, you know, a whole a whole range of, of other things. Um, and it's not just Gulf countries. I mean, actors around the world and region and authoritarian regimes are realizing that they have choices in this new world that Mr. Marzuki was talking about. Um, they can look to Russia and China to protect them on the Security Council, and they do in Myanmar, in Syria, in Ethiopia, and so on. So it's quite it's quite distressing, uh, and I think Mr. Marzuki also mentioned this this more global paradigm, where I think between 2016 and 2021, uh, the number of countries moving towards authoritarianism was twice that that were moving towards democracy. Um, but in any case, it does seem like Washington uh, thinks that solidifying strong men and their relationships with one another is the way to go. And it'll be easier to deal with in the Middle East as they face off with bigger problems in other parts of the world. And, you know, frankly, narrowing your interests and ambitions in the Middle East uh, and not being concerned with democratization and human security worked during the Cold War, the US won, so why not again? So I'm gonna explain three reasons why I think not again. Uh, authoritarian ineffectiveness, spillover, and sabotage, ASS. I, uh, I swear I, I came up with those before I realized what the acronym spelled, uh, but now you'll never forget it. But first, it took, it took a second. First, authoritarian ineffectiveness. Um, I think the Arab Spring itself, but also the incredibly dismal uh, humanitarian or human development and economic indicators that we see throughout the region uh, show us that this sort of rigid, oppressive authoritarianism is ineffective in facing the many challenges that the region faces today. Uh, we see unprecedented water insecurity in the region, unprecedented levels of unemployment, and this is even before the energy transition. A third of the countries in the region are embroiled in conflict, uh, and even bastions of stability like my motherland, Jordan, um, polls show that two-thirds of those under the age of 30 want to leave the country. That's pretty staggering, right? Uh, and that also gets me to spillover. So when people are forced to leave their country in this region, uh, or they want to leave uh, their country, they don't typically look at China or Russia as a destination. They look at Europe and the United States, and there's many polls and, and things to suggest this. At the same time, when these crises break out, it's primarily US donors and European donors that pay for the humanitarian crisis, right? So our response is essentially to uh, throw aid and sort of securitization at this. Um, I hear European diplomats sort of cautiously talking about how they're going to change their policy in Syria, and it's often through the lens of aid. And so you have them, you know, going into government controlled areas and shaking hands with regime officials and taking pictures with civil society. Um, and, you know, this is all part and parcel of trying to contain the crisis where it is. Um, and that's not a great cycle to be in because essentially we're rewarding regimes for the problems that they cause. And that gets me to the last point, which is sabotage. Regimes understand that. Russia understands that. And so if you have a situation where you can create problems that you're then rewarded for, uh, we're, we're in a, a little bit of a, of a terrible little dilemma. And I'm sure Amy will speak to this uh, on, on Tunisia and Egypt as well. Because um, if we step back and we look at the region and we think about the leaders, Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi, Ben Ali, Mubarak, Assad, we have leaders that stepped aside or they hid or they fled 
and they were dragged out of ditches and through the streets and put in cages on display. And Bashar al-Assad is, is walking red carpets. Russia, his military ally, won a warm water port in the Mediterranean, an air base, a launching pad into Africa, and expanded influence throughout the region at relatively little cost. Iran, his regional military ally, has won, if the US withdraws from Syria, an unobstructed path to the Mediterranean to expand its ep economic and military networks, which is devastating as we've seen in Iraq amongst other places. So, I mean, others are looking at this, regional powers, international powers, dictators, wannabe dictators, and they see a tempting playbook. And that's why we see it playing out over and over again in Sudan, throughout the Sahel, in Libya, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, I wanted to lay all of that out because I think the first step to solving a problem is admitting that you have one. And it's not clear to me that the United States thinks that it has one. Um, in terms of recommendations, I don't know if we're there yet, um, but I think my recommendations would be tempered by the realism of having worked on Syria for 15 years. And I think it would be inspired by the people that I've worked with on Syria for 15 years, because Syrians are survivors, they're not victims. Um, in working on civilian protection, I watched people sew together bed sheets to cover streets to protect people from snipers, um, build these sort of mushroom gardens to save themselves in sieges. Uh, I still remember this little girl who had uh, just left besieged Yermuk, uh, Palestinian Syrian little girl. Uh, and she was complaining to her mother that she she wanted this kind of chips and not that kind of chips. And her mother sort of cried and, and laughed and said, this little girl was painting mortadella on walls just a few weeks ago because she couldn't eat it. So I think my recommendations will be to help them survive. Um, and I think to do so, we need to be far more committed when it comes to aid um, and political support to civil society, both inside and outside the country. Um, I think working to try to shape whatever this disjointed step-for-step -step process is will be important, um, because what I see is a bunch of different nations pursuing their own national interests and giving away precious leverage while they do it. Um, and of course, pursuing accountability. But I think I would just, I would just conclude with this. Um, the United States, I think, generally needs to understand that these democratic movements are an opportunity, not a threat. Uh, they are a way to sort of give it to China and Russia. Um, and then we can also be the good guy that we've always claimed to be. <laughs> so I see, I see a lot of win-wins here. The, the question is whether the United States is going to see it that way. And then I would just say for the rest of us, um, before that happens, being a, a, pet, a pest optimist, um, I would just reiterate the words of um, the Egyptian journalist, Lina Atalla, who's been through quite a lot herself um, in that we, we simply can't be imprisoned to the hegemony of the present, which is quite gloomy. Thanks. Thanks, Natasha, for that opening uh, uh, framing. I think it was extremely useful because it provides a kind of window into the rest of the discussion. I'd only add that one of the things I see in US foreign policy is a tendency to treat Russia and China it's kind of similar threats without recognizing the tensions between them and perhaps exploiting them, but we can get into that later. Uh, Nader, you're going to tell us about the future of, of democracy uh, in Iran. We're going to talk about it today, and you and I have a conference tomorrow at Georgetown, so please. Well, thank you uh, for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. I want to speak about what I think is really going on at the Middle East at the grassroots level that is really shaping the future of the region and that is often ignored 
or completely misunderstood here in Washington and in most Western capitals. And my entry point, I just wanted to reference what everyone is aware of in this room, this new narrative that we're hearing from the White House and the State Department, that um, we're on the cusp of a historical moment in the Middle East, a transformative moment that will finally bring peace and prosperity to the region. And once it arrives, we can all go home. And of course, I'm referring to the Israeli-Saudi normalization deal that the Biden administration has invested a lot of energy in. This is a quantum leap for the region that could change the Middle East forever, says Netanyahu. The biggest historical deal since the Cold War, uh, says the Saudi Crown Prince. Blinken says normalization of relations between Saudi and Israel would be, quote, a transformative moment in the Middle East and well beyond. And Thomas Friedman has written that this would be a game changer for the Middle East, bigger than the Camp David peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, because peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia, the custodian of Islam's holiest places, Mecca and Medina would open the way for peace between Israel and the whole Muslim world. Now, while that's the mainstream view here in the United States and in Israel, it's a colossal distortion of reality for anyone who has spent any time in the region or on the ground. The Saudi-Israeli normalization plan is currently conceived, I think, is wishful thinking at best. It's a political disaster in the making at worst that will further destabilize the Middle East. Um, recall the framework for this deal is very much premised on the Abraham Accords. And as you will recall, the Abraham Accords was a secret agreement uh, um, that was cooked up by a neo-fascist American president and his corrupt son-in-law, a right-wing hawkish Israeli prime minister and several Arab dictators. And reportedly the notorious Tony Blair played a secret role in facilitating negotiations. By this measure alone, there should have the, the accords should have been met with deep skepticism. The fact that it has not been met with skepticism tells us something important about the ideological bias and erroneous assumptions within the mainstream American foreign policy framework in the Middle East. And I think the only value of these deals is that it's a teaching moment for us. It helps us understand, I think, what's, what's, what, it helps us understand the distance between the image that many policymakers have and the reality on the ground. Um, um, these deals that are being cooked up by, uh, by, that are supported by American foreign policy are really dependent on and predicated on the persistence of authoritarian repressive regimes in the Middle East, while ignoring the core aspirations of the region's people for political freedom, accountable government, and self-determination. So given its weak foundations, the likely consequences of these diplomatic deals over the long term, I think, will undermine political stability in the Middle East, while further impugning in the eyes of the people of the Arab and Islamic world, the reputation of its key signatories, Israel, Arab authoritarian regimes, and in the end, the United States of America. So what's really going on in the region? I think um, it's not controversial to say that these are the dark days of Middle East history, replete with torture states, corrupt ruling elites, repressed civil societies, detention centers overflowing with political detainees. Authoritarian regimes are ascendant everywhere, while democratic opposition groups, civil societies, and social protest movements are severely repressed, especially in the Arab world. When judged by the key indicators, such as democratic development, civil and political rights, press freedom, censorship, women's representation, the rule of law, the status of minorities, state-sanctioned executions, the countries of the Middle East have some of the lowest scores in the world. Adding to this grim picture is the mass expansion of poverty and economic destitution for hundreds of millions of people in the region. Data on global equality levels reveal that the Middle East, despite its abundance of wealth, has some of the highest wealth inequality scores in the world. The World Inequality Lab, co-directed by Thomas Piketty, reports that the Middle East is the world's most unequal region where the top 10% capture 61% of the national income. An, Ox an Oxfam report has confirmed these findings while observing that the uh, coronavirus pandemic has, ex has significantly expanded the problem of mass pauperization across the region. The picture becomes bleaker still. According to the 2021 Global Peace Index, the Middle East and North Africa region remain the world's least peaceful region. Many of the most unstable countries in the world are located here, and as a result, the Global Peace Index observes that conflicts in the Middle East have been a key driver of the global deterioration in peacefulness in the world since 2008. Now, some might argue, well, that's old news. We have a Saudi-Iran deal. They've patched up their differences. 
Um, I'd be happy to address that during the Q&A session. I think the Saudi and Iran deal and its consequences for peace and stability in the, in the region are grossly exaggerated. In their annual report on 10 conflicts to watch in 2021, the International Crisis Group confirmed that seven out of the 10 most destabilizing world conflicts were in the Arab Islamic world. This overlaps with another key statistic among the key uh, countries that produces the most refugees. Muslim majority countries constitute the clear majority. The top seven countries of the world that account for the most refugees in the world involve Muslim populations. Um, this is the socioeconomic and political reality that I think shapes the Middle East today and into the future. And it's a reality that no one in Washington, D.C. really wants to take seriously, ignored in much of the analysis on the Middle East, that this is a region that has been facing a growing and expanding human rights crisis for a very long time. In this context, two points need to be emphasized. First, the greatest violators of human rights um, in the Middle East are not the militant groups, which often get a lot of attention, but actually states in the region. Witness Syria, where since 2011, um, since 2011, um, more than half of the half a million people have been killed. And according to Human Rights Watch, 90% of these deaths are directly attributable to the policies of the Assad regime backed by Russia and Iran, including the repeated use of chemical weapons, state-sanctioned violations of human rights. Um, um, as a key cause, uh, state sanctions violate the violations of human rights as the key cause of human rights disaster in the region applies to all countries throughout the region with few exceptions. And one reason of this is because of state capacity, using the power that modern technology provides in terms of surveillance and monitoring, the lives of citizens can be controlled and repressed. Non-state actors really can't compete with authoritarian states in this area as the state has a near monopoly on the means of violence. Consider the 10 most populous states in the, in the Middle East, Egypt, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Syria, Jordan, the UAE, and Israel. In all of these cases, with the possible exception of Iraq, it is the state that is responsible for the vast majority of human rights violations. In the past decade alone, several cases stand out. In 2013, after a military coup in Egypt, more than a thousand peaceful protesters were killed by the Egyptian regime in downtown Cairo. Human Rights Watch described this as a likely crime against humanity and what may have been the worst single day killing of protesters in modern history. And of course, if you know anything about Egypt, it's a torture state with tens of thousands of political prisoners languishing in their jails, suffering horrific conditions and routine torture. Another massacre took place in the Middle East in 2019, this time in Iran. Rising fuel prices triggered nationwide protests that were ruthlessly suppressed. The internet was shut down. And within the span of a few days, at least 500 people were killed. Some people, some reports say up to 1,500 by Iranian security forces in various Iranian towns and cities in what Amnesty International called a killing spree. And then we have events over the last year since the death of Massa Amini. Um, at least 500 people were killed, massive torture, several, at least a dozen people executed, uh, many of them minorities, a horrific situation. I had a chance to write a human rights report re recently over the summer, reviewing the data and the documentation on Iran. And the UN Special Rapporteur uh, for Iran, I think, got it accurately when he looked over events in Iran in recent months and described the scale and gravity of Iran's response to these recent protests as, quote, a crime against humanity. The Turkish government has not been as brutal in terms of state violence, but under President Erdogan, Turkey has the distinction of being, quote, the biggest jailer of journalists in the world. Thousands of academics, judges, and government employees have been fired and prosecuted on baseless charges in the post-2016 crackdown. The recent elections, I think, under Erdogan have uh, given him another five-year term and will certainly expand the uh, stranglehold of authoritarianism over the region. And then, of course, we have Saudi Arabia and MBS, a disaster internally in terms of human rights. Um, let's not, so also not forget, in terms of state-sanctioned executions, the Middle East is at the top of the world. China's number one, Iran number two, Saudi Arabia number three. Um, uh, and so we have a disaster in terms of the human rights situation within Saudi Arabia. I mean, too many cases to mention the Israel-Palestine conflict continues to produce mass violence, particularly when there's a flare-up in Gaza. So in summary, the Middle East is facing a series of overlapping, mutually reinforcing crises that will eventually produce a political explosion. There's a human rights crisis. 
the worst the region has ever experienced. An economic crisis, a youth unemployment crisis, a refugee crisis, a collapsing and fragile state crisis, a crisis of good governance and political legitimacy crisis. And now on top of everything else, if you're following the news, there is a climate crisis. The Middle East is disproportionately affected by climate change. And there seems to be no serious attempt by any of the state governments to mitigate that. So in conclusion, in Western capitals, there is very little recognition of these underlying socioeconomic political catastrophes that affect the average citizen in the Middle East and North Africa. The quality of the lives of the average citizen, their economic, political security, and social security has gotten drastically worse. Recent events in Libya and Morocco, I think, highlight the fragility of life faced by millions of people around the world. We're often forgotten because of our US-centered focus on the Gulf and Saudi Arabia, where wonderful things are allegedly happening. These regions are non-representative of the larger Middle East. And so while all the talk today in Washington, DC is about a new mega deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel that will allegedly transform the region, none of the underlying socioeconomic data and figures that I have just cited, I think will be positively affected by this US-Saudi-Israeli deal. In truth, these figures will get much worse under the Abraham Accords, which are predicated on investing in authoritarian rule in the Middle East rather than opposing it. Authoritarian stability, anyone? Well, take a look at Sudan and get back to me on that thesis. How's that working out? Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Nader, for yet another very uh, uh, sobering uh, overview of the situation. Uh, you said a lot. And I'm going to come back to a lot of it. I have a question that's going through my mind, but I, I will get back to it after we finish the presentations. Amy, you have the floor. Well, I don't know if I'm going to be much more uplifting than <laughs> uh, my fellow panelists, but good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the Arab Center for organizing this important conference and for inviting me to be on this panel. I'm going to speak about Tunisia and Egypt two North African countries that, of course, are very, very different in many ways, but whose political trajectories over the past 12 or 13 years do share some important features. I'm going to describe these shared features, assess the prospects for a new democratic transition in each country, and conclude with a few thoughts on US policy. So in early 2011, as we recall, Tunisia and Egypt were the very first places in the Arab world where citizens rose up against and forced from power long-serving dictators in what became known as the Arab Spring, or as President Marzouki said, the Arab Volcano. I like that phrase. Uh, after these historic mass uprisings, each country broke with its authoritarian tradition and embarked on a democratic transition. In Egypt's case, of course, this was only a partial, a limited democratic transition and it lasted a short two and a half years. In Tunisia's case, democratization was much more far reaching and the transition there survived a full decade. But in each country, the democratic transition was brought to, brought to an end by a coup. In Egypt, it was a fully extra-constitutional military coup led by the defense minister, now president, uh, Abdel Fattah Sisi, uh, achieved through repression, mass repression and mass violence and supported crucially by billions of dollars in aid from Gulf countries. In Tunisia's case, the coup was carried out by contrast by a freely elected sitting president, President Kais Saied, who used a manipulated or false interpretation of the constitution to carry out his power grab in the name of the constitution. He did not receive any significant external financial backing for his coup, at least uh, any that has yet come to light. And he uh, accomplished his, his coup, his constitutional coup, his auto golpe with much more narrowly targeted repression and much less violence than was the case in Egypt. But in both cases, the institution that was leading the coup, the military in Egypt and the presidency in Tunisia, enjoyed historic legitimacy with a significant section of the public. And, the, and each coup did have initial popular and elite support. And in both countries, the main target of the coup was an Islamist party that had gained national political power through free elections. 
both coup makers were able to exploit widespread distrust of those Islamist parties, and they were able to manipulate the population's sense of instability and insecurity and economic vulnerability that many people felt under each country's democratic transition. And finally, as we know, both coups took place without any significant pushback, almost barely a shrug, from the Western democracies that had previously so loudly claimed to support the democratic transitions. Today, a decade after its coup, Egypt's authoritarian system is deeply entrenched. The political system that CC established features a central economic and governance role for the military, which has essentially unchecked powers, extreme repression baked into the legal system that CC um, uh, revised, and extra legal human rights violations, mass imprisonment, enforced disappearance, torture killing, used as tools of state control on a mass scale. In Tunisia, a little more than two years after its coup, authoritarianism, by contrast, is not yet fully entrenched in my assessment. Kaysayed has created what is effectively one-man rule, but his new system is not fully consolidated. To be sure, uh, President Syed's very rapid dismantling of key institutions that were created during the democratic uh, transition in Tunisia, an empowered parliament, an independent election commission, an anti-corruption agency, uh, he was able to dismantle those institutions very rapidly. And that was indeed remarkable. And he has, of course, issued his own autocratic constitution and promulgated a number of repressive decree laws, but he has not yet carried out a full crackdown a la Egypt 2013 to 2015. There's still some political space, some space for dissent. Uh, for example, Anahda and other opposition parties are not officially banned as such, though they, of course, have been severely weakened. The liberal legal framework for civil society remains intact, and the scale of political arrests is much more limited. And we do still see protests regularly in Tunisia, although they're not very large ones. What are the prospects? What's the future outlook for a democratic transition in each country? Well, in my assessment, the prospects for a democratic transition in Egypt and Tunisia are, at least in the short and medium term, uh, grim. To be sure, in both countries, the initial strong popular support that the dictator enjoyed right after the coup has apparently eroded. And I say apparently because, as we know, it's notoriously difficult to accurately determine public opinion in non-democratic systems. In both Egypt and Tunisia, there are many signs of limited and waning enthusiasm for the autocrat. If you speak to both elite and ordinary people in each country, many will privately say that the leader is a failure, a disaster. And sometimes this criticism does leak into the public realm. And these regimes, both regimes, have to go to some effort to, to squelch it. Elections have an embarrassingly low turnout, as President Marzouki uh, mentioned the 10% the or maybe even less turnout for Tunisia's parliamentary elections uh, last year. And both rulers disdain political parties and have avoided creating one of their own that they could use as a tool to mobilize and activate public backing. And that could potentially be a vulnerability for each one. Of course, another potential vulnerability for each dictator is that he is doing a terrible job managing the economy. Both Egypt and Tunisia are going through an economic crises that haven't been seen in decades. Indeed, both countries are risking uh, defaulting on their debt. Tunisia is risking bankruptcy. And the poorest citizens and the middle class are really suffering. And the crisis is even touching the upper classes. The ruler seems to have no vision or no plan, just muddling through, but keeping in place the policies that benefit the wealthiest and most powerful. This economic failure is certainly breeding widespread uh, discontent, it would seem, but neither Sisi or Syed face at present any imminent democratic threat for a number of reasons. And these reasons include that both leaders are successful enough at blaming the economic crisis 
and um, using a narrative that blames the economic crisis, excuse me, uh, for uh, shifts blame away from them. And this is resonates apparently with at least some of the public. CC uh, constantly blames the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the effects of the coronavirus pandemic um, for Egypt's economic crisis. And Said blames um, you know many things, uh, including uh, the corrupt politicians who ran the country for a decade and uh, foreign plots and so forth. Uh, both leaders seem appear, and I say appear because in these contexts, it's very difficult to assess public opinion with, with any full accuracy, but they appear to retain enough support from publics who believe that the alternative, an unknown alternative, is riskier than the known authoritarian status quo. And we know that lack of popular enthusiasm for a dictator does not necessarily mean that the opposition has active support. For one thing, in both countries, I would say there has been a profound discrediting of the experiment with democracy, of the democratic transitions. Democracy is associated for many people with ineffective governance, insecurity, instability, and economic failure. And a pro-democracy narrative is difficult for pro-democracy actors to convey, to promulgate for both logistical uh, and ideational reasons. Uh, for another reason, the opposition in both countries is weak and divided. In Tunisia, anti kaisaid uh, actors are polarized and there's a division among the opposition still to this day about whether Kaisayed or Anahta poses a bigger threat to the country. And in Egypt, we can just see recently uh, in recent days by all the quote opposition figures who have announced that they're running for President Sisi against President Sisi in the December elections, um, that they are more driven by, by ego and opportunism than by any serious strategy to challenge him, which of course, among other things, would require a unified opposition candidate. Um, I'm also struck by the fact that most the opposition in these countries does not is not able to convey to the public at least a clear alternative message or roadmap on the socioeconomic crisis. What would they do to solve the problems that this country, the, each country is facing? Their critique of the status quo is very strong, but their alternative governance vision is less clear, at least to me. And two additional factors that I think weigh on the side of um, uh, low prospects for democratic transitions is that repression is effective at maintaining um, authoritarian systems for longer than people might want to expect or admit. And finally, the international environment is generally favorable for these and other dictators in the MENA region. Uh, we see very little pushback or challenge from the US or Europe or other democracies. Now, what about US policy? Of course, there are a number of things that the US government could be doing right now to defend human rights and promote democratic values in Egypt and Tunisia. Uh, for example, the US government could regularly speak out against authoritarian abuses and in favor of democratic values. U.S. officials could visibly meet with opposition figures and pro-democracy actors. The U.S. could realign its foreign aid in favor of democracy support and human rights protection. And the U.S. could develop a, a you know, mount a serious effort to work in concert with its European allies um, to push for democratic change in human rights. But uh, just as I'm pessimistic about the chance of democratic transitions in the near future. I'm also pessimistic that the Biden administration uh, will do any of these things. Uh, I don't think that the Biden administration or the US Congress sees democracy promotion in Tunisia or in Egypt as a priority or even a necessity to protect US interests in either country. That's not the moment that this administration is. And there are a number of reasons for that, and I'm happy to elaborate on, on my assessment of that during the Q&A, but I would say um, that this administration and members of enough members of Congress, I think, are not convinced that uh, 
democratization is a worthwhile effort for the U.S. to get behind, that it's not worth the perceived cost to relationships with these authoritarian uh, leaders or U.S. security interests um, in these countries. That is the narrative that has taken hold very deeply, I would say, in Washington more generally. And until advocates of democracy um, in these countries and in the U.S. can effectively uh, mount a challenge or a counter narrative to that conventional wisdom that's taken hold. Um, I'm not very optimistic about the prospects for the U.S. Uh, playing a more vigorous role. Thank you. Thanks very much, Amy, for that superb overview, which also sort of refocuses our attention on the actions of the players and the responsibilities of the player on the ground. I, I would only say that the, the president of Tunisia, with all due respect, seems sometimes to live on a different planet. The other day, he uh, made the argument that the storm, Daniel, which hit North Africa and Greece, was named after a Hebrew prophet and that this was a Zionist conspiracy. Um, so this is the president of a country who's making this argument. So, uh, so one, one, it's extraordinary how much success he's had, uh, given the fact that he seems to be often on a different planet, I would say. And, uh, well, we'll get back to that. <laughs> Dana, please. All right, thank you so much for having me and thank you all for being here. Um, I was asked to speak about the Abraham Accords and the authoritarian legacies of, of kind of the post Arab Spring uh, uh, region. Um, so I guess what I, I'm gonna begin with kind of recapping a lot of the things that my co-panelists have already spoken about um, and kind of describe the context by which we can understand the Abraham Accords' uh, objectives and impacts. Um, so as has been previously mentioned many times already, um, we are, living in a reality where in the aftermath of the collapse of the Arab Spring, there has been a resurgence of authoritarian power. Um, and that has happened for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, pro-democracy groups and movements have found that um, that authoritarian grip is quite hard to shake, given the long years of authoritarianism that have um, actively polarized opposition and uh, limited the ability of these groups to, to mobilize effectively. But another reason is also regimes have been strengthened um, in some cases uh, by international intervention. Uh, so just very recently, uh, there was a paper in the Journal of Comparative Politics um, about by uh, Salam al Sadi. Sorry, I forgot to mention the name. Um, about how international intervention in many of these cases we've discussed today changed the um, decision making calculations uh, for a lot of these domestic regime actors. So uh, it made certain regime actors, particularly militaries in some cases, more intransigent about the democratic transition process. Um, so that's one aspect. And then um, the second way that international intervention has also impacted um, uh, you know, the post-Arab Spring kind of uh, resurgence um, is that these regimes have been allying with each other and finding uh, new modes and, and, and methods of transnational repression um, and, and facilitating uh, that kind of dynamic across the region. And I would argue that throughout all of this, the US has either been ambivalent at best or at worst, very harmful to pro-democracy efforts. Um, instead, the, the American approach to the Middle East, I would argue, um, can be characterized as authoritarian conflict management. So this is a term uh, um, from the political science like conflict literature um, that basically means conflict management that disregards calls to address underlying structural causes of violence and instead relies on instruments of state coercion and hierarchical st structures of power. So keeping that context in mind, um, the Abraham Accords becomes clearer and easier to understand in terms of its objectives and impact. So I'll, I'll start with the impact first. Um, as my research has shown, uh, the Abraham Accords have been very damaging to local conditions, um, both for pro-democracy movements and groups that exist, but also for pro-democracy sentiment. Uh, because they do not address structural causes of violence and they rely on state coercion to be implemented. And I'll explain how in, in, in a minute. Um, so here's, here's a couple of reasons why I think um, the Abraham Accords worsens local conditions and, and is indicative of this kind of larger American uh, uh, project of authoritarian conflict management. The first is that Arab public opinion is pro-Palestinian. This has been corroborated a number of times with a number of uh, different studies, different polling efforts, even those that are sympathetic to the Abraham Accords have found similar trends. Um, so when regimes uh, pursue these normalization deals with Israel, often with a lot of uh, US fanfare and, and support, um, they know that they are doing something unpopular. They know that inevitably some segment of society, some groups in society, there will be some level of dissent and outcry and opposition. 
um, which from their perspective then requires repression. And we saw that really in the immediate aftermath of the Abraham Accords, uh, protests across Bahrain erupted um, and were put down. Um, also in Bahrain, 17 civil society organizations from across the political spectrum put out a joint statement um, saying that they were against the Abraham Accords and uh, some of them faced uh, uh, um, uh, a backlash because of that. Um, additionally, there's this element that uh, pro-Palestine activism in particular in a lot of these countries is very central to civil society. So targeting individuals or organizations that have that uh, basic uh, drive of, of pro-Palestine activism um, really means hobbling civil society in some of these places. Um, so that's that's one point. The second reason is uh, the second reason the Abraham Accords worsen local conditions is that Arab regimes have a new partner now um, and, a, and a more uh, open and, and uh, uh, broader way um, in transnational repression. And um, not to suggest that there wasn't already some under the table, you know, security coordination and things like that between some of these Arab regimes in Israel, uh, even prior to the Abraham Accords. But what's happening is an intensification of these efforts. And we've seen a proliferation of repressive technologies, not just in terms of defense systems and military aid and things like this, but also in terms of surveillance. Um, I'm sure many in the room are most familiar with Pegasus. That's been kind of the big scandal in the last couple of years, but the, that's only one company. There's There's been plenty of others. Um, so that, that's another reason that it's kind of tightening the noose on all uh, groups that have any kind of pro-democracy uh, uh, sentiment. Um, the third reason is the Abraham Accords requires a, a deal of propaganda um, and a deal of... Um, you know, facilitating a, a certain kind of discourse um, in order to, you know, uh, push the Abraham Accords and make it acceptable to, to these societies. Um, we see this in particular in the case of the United Arab Emirates, where to kind of try to sell the Abraham Accords or at least uh, uh, justify the Abraham Accords, they used a lot of this discourse of tolerance and peace. Um, and at the same time, they claimed that anyone who opposed the Abraham Accords was then intolerant or backwards or even anti-Semitic. Um, and this is obviously very damaging uh, because on obviously like at a very basic level, propaganda is in and of itself an authoritarian practice uh, as it disables the communication flow from power holders to society and it makes regimes less accountable. But it's also not just that this theoretical realm, um, propaganda also has prompted actual repression like material repression. So in the Emirati uh, uh, example, in the immediate aftermath of the Abraham Accords, um, a number of um, Emirati accounts online were encouraging people to report on one another uh, via a designated app. And they said anybody that um, you know, uh, stands against uh, the, the, the UAE's uh, foreign policy decisions and or anti-Semitism should be reported. Um, so you know, it's, it's not just this issue that's stuck in the theoretical realm or can be ignored. It is actually having a very uh, um, uh, on the ground impact. Um, and based on a lot of the interviews I've conducted with, with activists and, uh, you know, others um, from these countries, this kind of activity and this kind of discourse has really frayed social ties. Um, because when people are being asked to report on each other, there's a, a deal of distrust that's being bred in society. So given that this has been the impact, then the pursuit of the Abraham Accords as a policy objective can't really be described as peace, but it's rather this idea of authoritarian conflict management that requires, as, as Dr. Nader, Nader already mentioned, a certain level of repression to ensure both material and discursive. So the fact that the US then pursues all of this is indicative of their objective, not of you know, promoting democracy or even caring very, very much about human rights, but just the, the objective of stabilizing the Middle region. Um, it's also indicative of the objective of using these deals to bolster their allies, both the Israeli and Arab regimes. And insofar as the Palestinian question is concerned, um, it's, only, it's only mentioned in order to take steps to contain it. Um, because the fact of the matter is, Israel did not have normal relations with the Arab world, not because we were missing an Abraham Accords or we, we were missing a Jared Kushner and a Donald Trump, um, but because of ongoing occupation, ongoing annexation, both of Arab and Palestinian land, um, ongoing human rights violations, and Israel's destabilizing role in the region. That was the crux of the, the, the conflict uh, uh, between these countries. So without resolving any of those kind of structural conditions, there, you, know, you really can't call it peace. Uh, I've argued before it's peace by name only. Um, 
And I think it's important also to note that the Abraham Accords really emboldens the Israeli government um, because it's just one more indication that from both Arab and now, uh, uh, sorry, both American and now Arab allies, um, that there is a, a great deal of impunity. Um, no matter what actions are taken on the ground, no matter how much they continue the aggressive status quo or even escalate it, uh, there's really no uh, cost to anything that they do. So even at the time when um, a lot of European and American officials were distancing themselves from Itamar ben Gavir, for example, the UAE, the Emirati uh, uh, embassy uh, in Israel invited Itamar ben Gavir to their national day. So it's, it's very much uh, a situation where um, the cost uh, uh, is, is very high on the Palestinian side and on the side of human rights and dignity, and no cost at all is imposed on the, on the Israelis with these kinds of deals. Um, so, so yeah, that the U.S. pursues all of this regardless means that, in my opinion, a just and sustainable future for the region is actively being prevented. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana. Um, exactly 10 minutes. Perfect. Yeah. And um, I think that uh, there's, I hope we find a light of sunshine somewhere <laughs> in today's discussion. But um, it, uh, I'm reminded, by the way, that you know, democratization in the beginning, its early stages, theoretically, uh, and practically, it usually is a form of conflict management, uh, not resolution. But you have to go beyond that. And that I'm gonna I'm gonna exploit my position as a chair to uh, pose a question on that very idea. But before I do, I've been asked to, re to remind the audience in the room to use the question and answer cards, which have been made or are being made available, and those watching on live to send their questions in via Zoom or by email, which are going to appear magically on my screen. Uh, so my, my question is this, and it, it, it's for anybody in the panel, but you know, maybe Amy wants to start it off. Um, uh, you know, if we look at the, 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 the story in, uh, in Tunisia, where I spent some time this summer, and many, many times before that, um, it's partly a story of political polarization. And it's partly a, a story of the, uh, the expert use of political leaders uh, uh, of uh, uh, manipulation of that polarization to increase their uh, political um, room for maneuver. And certainly the current president of Tunisia has been doing precisely that and been rather successful at it. So what do we, in terms of the ability for the actors on the ground to move beyond the kinds of cleavages and divisions which have really enabled uh, autocrats, um, what can be done to encourage that kind of dialogue between opposing groups, which has been so uh, effectively manipulated by the likes uh, of uh, the current president of Tunisia and actors throughout the leaders throughout the world. That's my question uh, for Amy and anybody else can jump in. Thanks very much. Thanks, Dan. What can Tunisians themselves do? Well, it's a question I think it's important to ask, right? Because we've been we're here looking at sort of the outside influences, but it's a necessary it's a necessary but insufficient condition. The president of Tunisia has been extremely adept at manipulating the resentment against the Nakhta, but all the parties, which are seen as largely responsible for uh, a pro, a, a years of immobilism and ineffective decision making. So, if we want to sort of talk about the process of democracy, what responsibility do leaders they have have on the ground to overcome their own divisions? Well, I mean, they do, I don't know about responsibility, but Challenge. if they, yeah, if if um, the parties and the movements and the and the groups that are that are challenging the return of dictatorship to Tunisia, um, they do face a, a there is a need i think for them as part of their strategy to um, understand what their failures were and explain to the tunisian public what they would do differently and what their vision is um, but that's a very difficult thing to do for a number of reasons um, not least of which is that one of the things that dictators um, autocrats like I say it do very effectively as they create you know this atmosphere of 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 tension and fear in which um I think political movements and opposition figures are primarily trying to survive and 
of course, Tunisia has an important history of different types of opposition movements coming together um, before the 2011 uh, revolution, coming together and forging sort of an opposition pact that transcended different um, political outlooks and ideologies. So I think there is there is a precedent for Tunisians being able to do this, Tunisian political actors. But I think in the current moment, um, it is a very difficult environment, at least inside the country, for people to do that. I think they feel that they would be, you know, risking, uh, risking a lot. Thank you. Yeah, Dan, just a quick comment on that. I mean, in many ways, it's the most important question in terms of the future of Tunisia. How do you unite the opposition? I mean, there's no secret formula here when it comes to contesting and confronting authoritarian regimes. You have to unite the opposition and divide the regime. And the opposition in Tunisia is deeply divided. And of course, we all know that the National Quartet Dialogue Group, you know, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2015 because of the role that it played in uniting the opposition to get Tunisia to, uh, to democracy. So, you know, why there hasn't been an effort, I think, to unite the opposition, given the misery that Tunisia is, is facing, is the million dollar question. I think um, one of the things we're seeing here is the legacy of authoritarian rule here is really haunting the Tunisian opposition because there are different moral reference points. They don't trust each other. There is deep anxiety. There is anger. There's resentment. And in many ways, the story of Tunisia is not unique to Tunisia. It's really the story of populism and authoritarianism everywhere, including in this country. A disdain for ruling elites, mass, you know, pauperization, economic despair, uh, looking for someone who, who can come in from outside and allegedly clean up the swamp. But then you realize that the person who's been entrusted with that is just making the swamp much deeper and much uglier. So, you know, what's happening in Tunisia today is a, is a Tunisian story, but it does have, I think, broad applicability to other countries that are facing authoritarian resurgences, including in this country. Yeah, I just wanted to to jump in on these points because I think this theme of fear is really important. There's this uh, Israeli anthropologist Mark Katriel that uh, that writes about how Israel has has sort of um, tried to entrench this feeling of fear amongst Israelis over the years um, through the education system, through the uh, the IDF, um, and so it was it was sort of thought I think in Washington if if Israel feels safer then they'd be more willing to compromise with the Palestinians and and clearly that has not played out or been the case and and that's because fear is is used as a tool uh, by these regimes and I would extend that to caution the United States because we also play into that fear right we did it in the Cold War. Um, you know, Filipino dictators said we're, we're going to crush communism. The, the communist threat is real in here, and we and we you know we we played we played into that uh, quite a bit. And then later on, during the whole counterterrorism era, uh, we did the same thing, and we played into that fear, or with Ethiopia and uh, of course Middle Eastern countries as well. So I think um, our policies need to also not be driven by that kind of fear, because it, it does lead to, I think, quite a lot of failures and, and over-promising as well. Right, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Nader, I have a question here that I think uh, is uh, worth talking about, and the question is, can someone talk about uh, Iran's support for authoritarian rulers in Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Yemen? Yeah, yeah, and that's a great question. I mean, Iran is often portrayed as a sort of a revolutionary actor in the Middle East. But I think from the perspective of the question, in many ways, um, for many countries in the Middle East, it's a status quo actor. Iran doesn't want revolutionary change in Syria. Uh, it doesn't want revolutionary change or upending of the political order in Iraq or in Lebanon. So in many ways, that framing that Iran is a revolutionary actor and you know other countries are a status quo uh, actors is, I think, in many ways, mis, uh, misguided. Um, um, I think Marzuki had it right that Iran is one of the regional powers that is um, behind the authoritarian order in the Middle East. Um, of course, it's part of the authoritarian order in the Middle East that the United States, you know, um, uh, is not backing because we're backing the other side of the authoritarian order in the Middle East. So in that sense, from, from an American perspective, I think there's a distinction there to be made. I'm not sure if there's anything more to say on that, but that's my reading of the topic. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, here's a question for a, a colleague of mine that the, anybody from the panel can uh, jump into. Given that China and Russia are trying, China, uh, sorry, China and Russia 
are trying to gain influence in the region and these countries don't even factor in human rights in their policies, that's obvious. Doesn't the, that work uh, to further entrench authoritarianism in the Middle East? So what role are these outside players? We mentioned Iran, that's an inside player, but China and Russia. I mean, I can just, you know, briefly jump in about Syria. Um, I, I think it was kind of a surprise uh, after uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine for a lot of people that that China somehow sort of jumped on board uh, with this. And I, I think it, it probably shouldn't have been surprising if you were watching what was going on in Syria. And I think a lot of people also pointed to the fact that China was not uh, really economically or militarily supporting Syria. But if you look at the Security Council, votes of China. Uh, since the PRC was on the Security Council in 1971, they've only had about 18 vetoes. Uh, 10 of those vetoes have been on Syria since 2011, uh, in lockstep with Russia. So um, I agree with you that there are some, some divisions perhaps um, that could be exploited between China and Russia, but right now I think that they complement each other in, in interesting and, and, and devastating ways. Uh, China provides sort of the political and uh, an economic weight to these relationships. And again, plays into the fear that the United States has uh, of, of any of these countries uh, siding with China. Um, and, and Russia is sort of the destroyer, right? I mean, I think uh, Politicians on in both parties have called it a glorified gas station in the past, right? But I think even a glorified petrol station can always make money and it can always pour gasoline all over the world. So it's helpful, I think, in distracting the United States from other bigger problems. So uh, I mean, I would I would say simply to that question, yes, of course, I think I think China and, and Russia play a, a big a big part in this for for different reasons. Thank you. Know? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would say that, you know, if we look at the region as a whole, the United States and Europe are the main external powers that are supporting authoritarian systems in this region, not Russia and China. Russia and China's active economic, uh, military, security support for these countries, for these regimes, I should say, while it has uh, increased over in recent decades, um, is not as nearly as significant, as weighty, uh, as substantive as the support that the US and Europe provide. But what these uh, many of these regimes, many of these leaders have been able to do quite successfully uh, so far is to um, use sort of a hedging strategy in which they uh, dangle in front of the United States and Europe the prospect of greater cooperation, closer ties with China and Russia as a way of uh, scaring the US off from putting too much pressure on them. So I think in that way on human rights and a number of other things. And so in that way, Russia and China have become um, increasingly important actors in the authoritarian uh, equation in the region. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's uh, the, that hedging strategy is absolutely uh, critical and quite effective uh, and quite predictable as well. I'd only add that it's hard to imagine that uh, Assad would have survived without the Russian intervention. I mean, he really saved, they really saved his regime. Um, and, and then the United States position was they weren't ready to go to war with Russia in Syria. And uh, the rest is history. Yeah, the Russian foreign minister is on record as saying they thought Assad was about to collapse oh, well, within the next few weeks and they had to step in. Yeah, well, that, that saved him. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, Amy, here we have a question about uh, the role of the Emiratis and other Gulf countries in um, in Tunisia itself, uh, and also the relationship uh, to, or perhaps the role of the military, which has shifted dramatically in Tunisia from one of keeping some distance from the political arena to being slowly, I suppose, seduced by uh, by the president. So if you have any uh, light to shine on that. You know, this is such an interesting question. What, has, what was the role uh, and what is the ongoing role of the United Arab Emirates? Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, in um, supporting Kai Saeed's coup and supporting his, you know, continuing in power. There, it's something that um, stirs up a lot of uh, rumors and suspicions and very interesting and worrying kind of anecdotal evidence. But 
um, when I've looked into this issue, it's been very difficult to pin down um, with clarity and precision exactly what role these authoritarian powers have, have played uh, in Tunisia. So that's not to say that they haven't played a role and that they're not playing a role, but in contrast to Egypt, where a lot of information immediately or very quickly came out into the public realm describing um, the, illuminating the role that uh, these countries had played in the coup, in Sisi's coup. Uh, in Tunisia, the picture is a lot more murky. So maybe in the future, um, there'll be more facts that come to light, but it's a widespread belief, but it's difficult to document, I think, with, with clear evidence. Yeah, that's the other question. Somehow, oh, the yeah. oh, the role of the Tunisian these are somehow linked in this question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's my assessment, and this is shared by you know many people that uh, Kaisayid could not have carried out his coup without the support of the Tunisian military. It was I wouldn't describe it as a military coup. Uh, maybe these are just semantic differences or analytical differences. Um, it looks very different than what we saw uh, in Egypt or what we've recently seen in Niger, for example, what, what unfolded in Tunisia. But clearly, without the backing of the Tunisian military, Qais Saied could not have carried out and executed his plan uh, successfully. So the military, Tunisian military, is implicated uh, in this uh, this crushing of, of Tunisia's democratic transition, in my view. Just one addition to that. I mean, Amy is absolutely right. The evidence is very thin, and we don't have a smoking gun showing a direct line of connection between the UAE and support for the, you know, the 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 authoritarian uh, transition in in Tunisia. But what we do know, if you recall, right after the 2021 coup, um, there was a proliferation of uh, social media activity supporting the coup coming out of the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, which controls the Twitter sphere. Uh, so that is, I think, revealing uh, the, in and of itself. And of course, just politically, um, you know, the, the, these authoritarian regimes, particularly the UAE, and especially the UAE, were horrified by the Arab Spring and, and the fact that it began in um, Tunisia and the fact that you had a, an Islamist party there that was in coalition with secular parties. That was a nightmare scenario. You know, you want that model to be defeated. And so I suspect in the future, when the evidence comes out in some future moment, there's going to be a lot of evidence pointing to a lot of Emirati sort of money manipulation and malfeasance trying to undermine democratic, you know, movements in the region. Uh, thank you very much. I also, on this issue of outside influence, I, I, I've written about this with the Arab Center. There, one, there was a, a dynamic that proved very unhelpful to uh, the success of democracy in Tunisia, and that was the way the conflict in Libya kind of infiltrated to the uh, Tunisian uh, political arena, particularly when Hulushi began to make, uh, make efforts uh, to, to reach out to, to, to uh, Turkey. This antagonized not only the president at the time, but also his opponents in the parliament. And that really helped to drive the, the polarization uh, process very deeply and had a lasting effect. So there are other ways in which regional dynamics Affect uh, affect the nature of Tunisian politics, and the country was very vulnerable to these. I have a question here that is really an interesting one for all of us to ponder, particularly given the kind of uh, the sad sort of picture we've drawn here today, without many lines of optimism. The question reads as follows: uh, You mentioned a likely upcoming political explosion due to the deterioration of human rights. How do you imagine that that might come about? What might it look like? I think that's a really interesting question for anybody to ponder. What does, you know, what is the, what is the absence of democracy or the persistence of authoritarianism? If it leads to an explosion, what, is, what, what are we talking about? Are we talking about, um, for example, if the regime magically would fall tomorrow in Iran, and I'm not predicting that, that it will, um, will there be a liberal democracy? Will there be, a, 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 what will there be? Perhaps a, a, a civil war. I mean, there are all kinds of prospects. So what does this explosion look like? Where are we going in, in, in absent of any sort of significant success on the political reform democracy track? I'll, I'll, quickly, go all the way to I'll quickly take a stab at that. We have, we, we have a sense of what it's going to look like. Um, prior to the COVID crisis, um, there were protests breaking out in several countries across the Middle East for very similar reasons. 
protests in Algeria, protests in Iraq, protests in Lebanon, and in several other countries, protests in Sudan that led to the toppling of the dictatorship. And they were protests that were really driven by, at least in many of these countries, deep economic despair, deep disdain for ruling elites, deep sort of economic vulnerability that people were just sort of, you know, coming out on the streets because they can no longer make um, ends meet. And I think that's a sign of things to come. You had similar protests in Iran too. There were protests over basic economic issues, but then quickly they transform into political demands for substantive political change. Um, I think that's what we can see and expect, whether those will lead to, you know, deeper structural, you know, changes in these authoritarian regimes. Well, from my perspective, I certainly hope so, but there's no guarantee and knowledge as to when these might happen. But I think those events in 2019, particularly in October, in the countries that I mentioned, is probably a, a, a window into how these things are going to manifest themselves, if they do manifest themselves again. Anybody else want to sort of think out loud about this, what the scenarios would look like? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we've seen some of the scenarios already. Um, in Libya, tragically, most recently, um, but I, I mean, I have interviewed probably hundreds, if not thousands of Iraqis and, you know, time and time again, this was uh, sort of after the, the US withdrawal, uh, one person after another was telling me about being arrested and detained in the Ministry of the Interior, tortured, they had the same floor. And I just thought to myself, something's, something's going to happen, it's going to be terrible, right? Because in the midst of all of this, black swan events are a lot more possible. And I couldn't have predicted ISIS, but um, you know, I something like it was coming, right? And I don't know what's going to happen in Libya, um, but this kind of you know banality of willful neglect and corruption and human rights abuses, uh, it has consequences, right? And sometimes it's a dam fa failure, sometimes it's a terrorist group, sometimes it's complete state collapse. Um, but I think we need to be really wary of this. Uh, authoritarian conflict management um, because just dealing with these leaders at the top is really ignoring the decay underneath and uh, a lot can happen as, as Nadir was was mentioning with that with that kind of decay I'll I, also say oh, please sorry. go ahead um, I'll, I'll also say um, I think we should keep in mind that there whatever happens in the near future is going to be understood through the prism of a failed Arab Spring so mm -hmm. You know, people may have protested with a certain modality prior I, and has, have seen the results now and have seen the backlash and have seen the repression. And so it's, you know, the likelihood of violence, I think, is much higher uh, in, in the coming years than, than, than before. Um, the added element is that, of course, a lot of the political leaders and thinkers and activists have either been imprisoned or killed or, uh, you know, uh, banished into exile. And so there is a disconnected, more of a disconnected movement for pro-democracy across the region than, than you know, in the uh, in the years uh, up to the Arab Spring, where there was a bit of an opening. I, I really agree with that. I think that the next um, wave of dissent, the next explosions, uh, the political explosions, social explosions that we may see uh, in this region uh, may be a lot angrier a lot darker, uh, perhaps not pro-democracy explosions as we've seen in the waves um, of uprisings in 2011 and 2019. There's a very different mood in the region today. And I think we shouldn't, we should always keep in mind all of the people across this region who are really bravely fighting for democracy and justice and human rights. And they're very resilient and they do exist for sure but there is i think also this overlay of in the public imagination of um, failure and disappointment and bitterness with what happened when people when these countries attempted democratic transitions before so sorry to be so <laughs> kind of dark but yeah well it's it's unavoidable i we haven't discussed yemen i mean we don't we're not this is not included formally on the panel but i and talk about sort of dark horizons, but if anybody wants to comment about sort of the, the, the current state of the Yemen uh, conflict and the role of outside powers, which can, can't be possibly done in two minutes, I recognize that, but I think we need to say something if anybody cares to on, on that particular subject, I'd invite Natasha. Well, well, the good news is that 
the Saudi-Iran rapprochement has at least put a pause to the killing and suffering in Yemen and created space for um, discussion and dialogue. Whether that's going to produce a political settlement, I remain very skeptical because I think what the Saudis are demanding of the Houthis is a bridge too far for them to accept. And so I think you know the, the best that we can hope for is at least the guns have fallen silent for now. And whether there's an external actor that can sort of, you know, step in to bring the parties together, that again, I think is wishful thinking, because I don't see the United States trying to, you know, uh, you know, shepherd the two sides together to bring a settlement. Um, um, so I think my own reading is that the Yemen conflict is going to stay as it is. And then if Iran, you, if Iran Saudi relations start to deteriorate, we're probably going to see that theater uh, exploding again because Iran will find it to its advantage to try and stir up conflict there because it knows it upsets the Saudis. Anyone else? Okay, um, it's uh, we're getting close to finishing. I want to put out a question that I think needs to be addressed here, but Amy was alluding to, and that is sort of the state of uh, uh, of uh, economies and market reform in the region and the role that plays in uh, sustaining autocracy. Of anything can be said about the, the Tunisian story, it's the, one of the failures was the failure of economic and market reform and the way in which uh, whatever was attempted in, in the realm of market reforms was associated with capitalism. So corruption, market reforms, IMF, you know, that was the formula that people perceived. And that really, I think, uh, uh, really took away from or certainly degraded support for democracy because it was the assumption was what that, that the nature of democracy itself in Tunisia had contributed and it was a driver of corruption. And of course, um, uh, that uh, is related to the role of the IMF, the effort to bring about an economic reform program, which has not succeeded, did not succeed since 2016. That's a bigger story in the region about sort of the fate of economies and the difficulties of shifting from state control of economies and the role that that plays. That's the subject for a different con con conversation, uh, but it's something we've simply not mentioned today in our discussion. And I think anybody who wants to offer their thoughts on that before we wrap up, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, briefly, I would just say that one thing that really struck me um, observing Tunisia's democratic transition from afar was um, how coherent the uh, political arrangement for democracy was among the key actors. They actually came together um, after Ben Ali was, was ousted remarkably quickly to forge a consensus, a consensus that didn't last but did last, you know, it lasted for, for a decade more or less about a political system. Um, but there was never, and I don't believe that there is now, any sort of um, correlate economic vision. <laughs> There's a real vagueness, I think, among a lot of uh, Tunisian political actors about what their vision for the economy is. And those uh, such as the FF Tunis party, for example, that have articulated a more liberal economic platform have really failed to gain, you know, much if any public, uh, significant public support for their vision. And actors who actually advocate a statist response to Tunisia's economic crisis, the opposite of market reforms, a redoubling of a sort of state capitalist, um, statist economic system in Tunisia, those actors often have the most uh, clear, also, you know, unworkable in certain ways, but clear description of what they want to see. So there's a real lack of clear vision for an economic alternative that would be better than the status quo. And that's been the case, I think, since um, since 2011. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But, I mean, just to rewind to, to, to 2010, um, I was in Syria in 2010, and I was trying to assess the, the sort of the ramifications from the displacement from the drought in the Northeast, which a lot of people have um, incorrectly said was essentially the, 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 the prompt for the, for the Syrian revolution. Um, what, what's missing, I think, in that drought context is, is this is a, a region that has cyclical droughts uh, for, for many decades, right? Um, the, the part of this is, is sort of the liberalization that was taking place without real social safety nets at the same time. So the regime was getting rid of diesel subsidies and other things, 
um, after a period of, of decades of supporting really unsustainable agriculture amongst, amongst other things. And I'm sure that the Jordanian government, for example, looks to, to those examples with uh, a little bit of, of, of caution and as do other countries uh, in the region. And I think we need to look at it with a little bit of caution too, uh, with the World Bank and the IMF, because imposing these kinds of austerity measures on these countries without really adequate uh, social safety nets or, or sort of thinking about all of the various ramifications is kind of dangerous because these populations have been offered a lot, right? I mean, basically like free water, free energy, um, a lot of public sector jobs for years now, um, just ripping that from under them is, is also, I think, um, potentially dangerous, especially in an authoritarian society where you don't really have uh, a pressure valve to kind of release some of that tension. Um, so I, I would just leave it, I think, at that. Absolutely. Disengaging from the old social contract is extremely difficult and replacing right. it with the, in Tunisia, of course, there are a lot of people who pay a very high price for the austerity measures demanded by the IMF. Uh, IMF's position initially was that they that it wanted to see the democratic experiment continue, but it's abandoned that position effectively and is now ready apparently to support uh, austerity measures without reform, but of course the president doesn't agree to that formula at all. But that's an outside sort of player. It's extremely significant in the nature of where these regimes are going. So I think uh, one has to keep that in track. There are many other issues and questions we could talk about today, and I'm sure we'll return to them as the conference moves forward. I want to thank our terrific panelists for a great discussion, audience for great questions, and uh, look forward to pursuing this during lunch and afterwards. Thank you very much. Uh, just to jump in, uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, these panel walls to your right and to your left will open shortly, and you can grab lunch on either side. We just ask that you take it back to your seat, have it in this room, chat amongst yourselves, take care of anything you need to. And in 30 minutes, our lunchtime keynote with Hanan Ashrawi will begin. So please, you're welcome.